Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. Glad you're here this morning. Great to be back. I want to thank Mark and Bill for taking care of the show yesterday. When we and I were out, and we just uh, had a wonderful trip, but we're glad to be back. And uh, I know you're glad to see me. Let's get started with our weather, brought to us by our good friends up at uh, Gulf Coast Air Conditioning, Drew Pollard, and hardworking crew. And it's weather-wise, going to be mild. It's not. It's not going to be real, real cold like it was last week. Thank goodness. Uh, water temperature is reflective of air temperature, 62 degrees water temperature. Air temperature is high 77 and low 65, so that's pretty close right there. We're looking at the river readings. We're looking at Appalachia Cove, Blunstown. It's going down some. It's right at 10 foot, still in double digits. It's going down, and it's going to be some uh, good fishing this weekend. It's got some spotted showers coming through. Chalksachie, Caraville. 6.4, and it's dropping off a little bit. The thing about both those rivers, uh, when they're dropping out, uh, it just seems like to, I've always had a, the experience and uh, talked to people the same way. I feel really good about dropping water uh, if it's not dropping too fast. You, want, you, you, you don't want to do this, you want to do this. And it's, uh, so anyway, I just I can uh, remember catching them on O'Clockney when it's dropping out. The uh, tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Long. Folks, look at these tides. Are these great tides or what? Low 457 this morning, high 611. Best tides of the year. And I'm, I'm saying that seriously right now. Uh, look how strong they are. But look at next week's tides. Today's the 18th and just three or four great days of tides. And the wind, I've got the wind coming in south, southeast at about 14. So that's going to increase the incoming tide in all of our base systems. I want to, let's talk, I didn't get a chance to do the moon, uh, Monday moon uh, forecast, and it was because of, uh, we, we just had a tape show there, and I appreciate the uh, cards and letters on the duck hunt. Uh, we enjoyed it. So the moon now is going to be at a new phase, uh, the 21st, so that's Saturday. Have a new moon coming up Saturday, so with this tide and a new moon coming, should be some good outdoor activity. Let's take a break, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Uh, Jeff and I are talking about health and all. I know this is an outdoor show, but listen, a, a lot of sickness going around, colds and, and, and flus and everything, and, and uh, everybody coming down with stopped up, uh, this and that. Uh, I always, uh, when I start feeling a sore throat coming on, I gargle with hot salty water, <laughs> a warm salty water. That goes back to when I was this high. My mom, my, my brother and I put it on there and it was, it was all about to kill us. But over the years, that's, that's the best thing we've ever done as far as keeping the sore throat away. Just want to pass that on to you as a health note from Panhandle Outdoors. Let's get on and look at some of these pictures. Uh, so I just told that to Jeff. Check this, Ansel Levy up there. And look here, fishing on the Chipotle River. Here's Ansel right here, okay. Lori, good morning, Winston. Lori and I were fishing the Chipotle River yesterday. It was slow fishing until Lori hooked up with this bowfin. bowfin. We had no idea what it was until a fellow fisherman came by and told us. She caught it with a brim set up with a six pound test, a great fight. Look at that right there. Now, these, this in the Chipotle, the reason, look at there. The reason these are such strong fighters, I mean, that's all it is, a little fighting machine. I mean, it's all, all muscle, and it just, it can, it really can swing back and forth with that tail. And they really are strong, good sport fish. You know, I don't know if they'll eat it or not. I, I understand they're bony, but uh, they still got meat on them. Okay, moving on. Cecily Hell. There's Cecily again, real-time fishery. She remember she got one last week with her dad. That's the hell from Weewall. And what did she say? Uh, she said, the life. There's no two words, the life. She absolutely loves getting out in the woods. So that's I'm going to come by this week and get some grouper and let you tell me that story. Horner Ray, one of my viewers over there, in, on, over there at Santa Rosa, uh, to say it was the most exciting moment of my hunting career would be an understatement. His daughter, his first deer. Uh, congratulations, Emery Ray. A very happy dad and granddad. Here are the pictures right here. All right. I know she's excited. 
I've got some good stories of some first deer this year, some really good ones. There you go, the family. Good job, memorable time. Chris Rushing, I, I, I don't show all the deer I, get, I, I run across, I show a bunch of them. I want to show this because this is on the wildlife management area, the Econfina Wildlife Management Area. Look at that size of that now. You're talking about, that's public land, folks, getting a deer like that you know, on public land. And I have a lot of admiration for someone to, to do something like that. Good job, Chris Rushing. Here's a better picture of it. Look at the mass. You know, that's like a 10-pointer. I know it's five on one side. I couldn't tell on this side. That's a 10-point buck. Interesting. Terry Galloway Cowan. Uh, she's a good outdoor lady as far as she loves getting outdoors. But needless to say, look what she said. I won't be hunting in the ground blind anymore. I will stick to my redneck blind that's 10 feet in the air and tightly enclosed. This ground rattler was slithering behind me. Thankfully, I heard the leaves rustling and started looking for what was in there with me. Now, you, folks, you think that's not scary? You sitting there real quiet on that ground blind and see the acorn down there and all, and all of a sudden you hear the leaves moving like a movie. The leaves are moving and turn around and what is there? A ground rattler, and they can really, uh, they can really uh, hurt when they, and they're very painful and sometimes deadly. So. I, I, I hunt with a ground blind a lot, but I, I rake out all my leaves and everything. <laughs> but still, David Hawkins, David's a fine hunter. What an awesome afternoon. Uh, he said, well, don't need to go to the doctor because my ticker is okay. It felt like my first time ever squeezing the trigger, and I hope I never lose that feeling. My best Florida buck to date. A beautiful 12 point. Folks, a 12 point right here in the Florida Panhandle. Good job, David Hawkins, and uh, I know your heart was beating fast. <laughs> I'm glad you had that feeling. He brought a good man. I'll never lose that feeling. That's great. There's this, another picture of it. Good job, David. My buddy Ed Popper, old high school teammate, uh, lives up there in Gaston County. They have white, we have white squirrels in certain areas, and, and Ed's got some around his house. He took a picture of it. He said, my, he needs a little camo outfit because he's not, he's not blending in very well. I've often thought about trying to get, capture some of those and bring them down here, get a little colony started here, but never have gotten around to it. They're just cool little things. Donnie Messer, another big one. It's such a great afternoon. Thank you, Lord. Here's, here's Donnie right here. Donnie, Donnie gets a big one every year. Donnie Messer, a fine welding man and a fine man. All right, here we go. If a man says he will fix it, he will. There's no need to remind him every three months. Gail, are you watching this this morning? Okay, that's enough pictures for now. We've got a, got a lot of stuff coming up. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. I want to say good morning to Don Clark down in Port St. Joe. He's a trout fishing phenom and uh, watch the show every morning, so appreciate you watching uh, Don Clark out of Port St. Joe. One of the things, <clears throat> we just got word that the Sea Quarters Kingfish Tournament, and one year we fish every year since the inception of it. Uh, my buddies Tony Bass and, and Wendy Colson and myself, we have always fished it. It's always been the first weekend in August. They have now, and it's been a two-day tournament. They have now changed things a little bit. You know, Mr. Jimmy Crowder passed away, but the family is very adamant about keeping it going. They've changed the date. It's going to, they're going to be moved up to June. It's going to be June the 17th. It's going to be a one-day tournament. And to be honest with you, a lot of us that are inside, I say inside, a lot of folks, guys and girls that came year after year, we had about gotten to that point where we sort of was hoping it'd be a one-day tournament. Not that we didn't, it's, it's hard to fish a two-day tournament, uh, especially a second day. It's, it's hard. It's it really uh, you got to really be uh, on the ball and just got to have everything clicking for you. A lot of times things go wrong and you're not able to, to get it. So we talked before about just and Jimmy. We talked to Jimmy about it. He was willing to do it. So the family has moved it to a one-day tournament. It's going to be June the 17th. We talked also moving. August has always been so hot. And we've always talked about moving it up some, so it was sort of consensus of feeling. They didn't make the ruling by themselves. They talked to all of us. So I think it's a win-win for, for them. It would be easier to put it on with just one big day of, of festivities. And then also uh, uh, it would be easier on us, too. <laughs> we won't get beat up that bad. But 
the good thing about a one-day tournament, you can be lucky and not good. <laughs> you can, you can, in other words, you can win the tournament. Uh, a lot of times you just you get across that one big fish that one day, and a lot of you'll you be a rookie and go out there and win it. And a lot of times uh, you go out there as a, uh, and for a two-day tournament, that's what separated the, the guys that won it on those two-day tournaments. They were not lucky. They were, they were good. Well, we were good. And but now you can be lucky and win this tournament. So I want to encourage you all to uh, look into it and, and run down that fish it for a day. I, I'll show you the spots where to go, but just want to keep that in mind. Also, just uh, Mark and, and uh, Bill yesterday were talking about winter fishing. And it, it's just such a, like, it's, like they said, it's such a fun time to fish, especially when it warms up. That's the mild weather we're having right now. And we've talked about it before. The water clarity has been is so good. And Mark brought up a good point about being so quiet because everything's sort of stillness and all. I just want to reiterate what they were saying yesterday. And the, the big thing, though, is, is being able to switch baits and see what they enjoy. I, I enjoyed the stories they were talking about. Also, I wrote down creeks and canals. Uh, they, they were doing a lot of open fishing, but do not forget about the creeks and canals, the double C. Uh, a lot of times when it gets really cold like this, we're talking about the trout moving up. You remember you know, fishing out of steam plant canal, uh, which is not there anymore. The canal is, but the, the plethora of fish are not in there like they were doing because they were going up to warm water. So they're still doing the same thing. They're looking for warm water up in the creeks and canals. So that's really a good good place to go fishing. Uh, speaking of, let's, let's switch over. I want to cover the dates we have uh, because this time of year, you sort of ask yourself, and when, when is the hunt season over and what's coming up next and everything? So I just wanted to show, let's go over real quick. Uh, let me see. The dates. I'm just zone D. Okay, here we go right here. Uh, gun season, the big thing right here in the center. Gun season goes through uh, February the 19th. Okay, so, and then the, at the bottom, the muzzle loading season is right when it closes. Muzzle loading opens February 20th and 26th, which is a good time. Okay, so, and then the other one, uh, squirrel, if any of y'all out there, squirrel hunting and quail hunting on, on state property, it goes through March the 5th. And, and the daily bag limit on both is 12. Okay, so uh, I have yet to uh, see anybody send, send me very many squirrel pictures. Okay, now I've got this story. This is interesting. I, I keep up. I'm on the FWC. Uh, they send me uh, everything to do with news releases, and I enjoy. Uh, most of them are really good, informative, but they sent this one the other day, and I, I just got a, I want to say I got tickled and uh, got entertained and, and yet amazed that this goes on. I'll show you the headlines right here, then I'm going to try to explain it to you. The headlines right here. A multi-year FWC investigation is called Operation Viper leads to numerous charges for venomous and prohibited snake traffickers. They just, they just busted them. So I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna okay, here, here's here's all the report right here. It gets it gets. I, I went through it last night in detail. So I'm gonna sum it up. I'm gonna give you the cliff note versions of it. Basically, what what these these guys were doing, they they knew their snakes, and uh, they it's, the investigation started in June of 2020. Did I tell you how long it's been going on? And what's interesting, they let let some of the charges sunset expire in order to keep it going so they could get, you know, they always talk about working up to the big guy and that's what their goal was. That's why it took so long. And uh, some of the things they, they, it was eight, in, eight individuals, they, it, they, some of the charges, some misdemeanors, but most of them were felonies. It was a black market of, of highly venomous snakes. Here are some of the snakes they had, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the highly venomous, okay? The most venomous in the world and that's why they were doing it. Uh, the viper, the, the uh, cobra, the spit, the spitting cobra, the uh, vipers, the mamba, the uh, puff adders, you know, all those that are just super venomous, the most dangerous in the world. <clears throat> they were able to do it like over social media. They had codes and everything about, they would show pictures and like they were just, you know, there's nothing wrong with showing pictures, but at the same time, there was, people understood they were showing pictures so they could sell them to so-and-so. And it was really, it was uh, very, very uh, discreet is what they were doing. Uh, what they wanted, the, go the goal, this is what, what really surprised me. Their goal was not just to have them. It's not, it's not illegal to have those if you have a license. Well, these guys, had most of them had license. But what their plan 
the ultimate plan and their, what their structure would look like they were trying to do, they wanted to release them in native, hab in native habitat. And I'm going to give you an example. The Florida Everglades, what do we have in there? The boa, and ha how, many, uh, how many times do we have to go down there and, and, uh, and, and get that? They were going to release them and then let them just start multiplying like in the Everglades. I'm not many they, they could adapt to it because that was their habitat across the world. They were just they fit the habitat in. And they're going to release them there. And then later on, they're going to be able to capture them and whatever. So they, uh, it was going to be it was really something. I commend the FWC for going all the detail. And I could, they, they also they teamed up with some Georgia, with the Georgia Department of uh, Wildlife, because there was a lot of that was Georgia, Florida, some of the Okefenokee Swamp kind of stuff. and. It's just all kind of interesting details. I, they didn't give all the details on it, but I know an investigation like that had to have been uh, interesting. So I want to share that with you. You just never know what people, is that not surprising? Who knew they were trying to do something like that? Let's take a break, we'll be right back. Hi, right, welcome back. I want to go ahead, uh, well first let's look at our fishing game time. So brought to us by Blue Water Outriggers in Port St. Joe. Looking at 7.35 this morning to 9.35 and this evening 8.06 to 10.06. A nice day, looks like a, a little scattered showers and all, but rain coming in maybe tomorrow. But it's a good good day to be outdoors. And I hear more and more great stories. Speaking of great stories, when you when you do something, I, you know, I've always ended the show with doing something good for someone else. I've always meant that from the bottom of my heart and just part of being a part of your lifestyle. And and if you when you do something like that, uh, every now and then let me know and I want to share it on the show. It would help other people. I won't have to call out your name because you don't do something for other people to, for your own credit. You do it to do it to help them. So I understand where you're coming from. So. But I, I like to share it on the show, and uh, it was just, I, I think people would enjoy that on occasion. We don't do it every day, but say, I, I never forget, I won't call out the guy's name, but a guy I know, he, he called me uh, after I, uh, one morning and said, hey, Coach, I did something good for someone today. I said, that's great, blank, blank. I said, uh, who, uh, well, tell me what you did. He said, well, I took my mother, he lived here, I took my mother-in-law to Tallahassee. And I couldn't help but say, well, did you bring her back? <laughs> he said, yeah, I did. I said, well, that was something good. So anyway, do stuff like that, and, and uh, that's fun kind of things to do. Uh, moving on, uh, talking about the uh, freshwater, freshwater cold water fish, I want to show this. Jeff Pick is a good fisherman, okay? Lake Seminole, I've talked about it before on the report. Lake Seminole is just a good place to catch crappie. That's a nice one, Jeff Pick. I've fished with Jeff before. Uh, he's a good fisherman. Now, but the big thing, again, we're talking about the water temperature, and I, I put this up, I show it about twice a year. I show it in the, in the summer, uh, especially in springtime I show it, but especially, okay, so uh, here, bottom line, January, February, so each one of those blocks, okay, is a month. Now what I wanted, you really need to study, and this is the average temperature since 1984. The middle, the white line is the average, and then on the end, on the top and bottom lines, or the extremes. So you can see we have some extremes. So that first block, January, so that's where we are. We're about to get into February. So you can see we're in the coldest times of the year, right there on the left, where it said that number 20. That's actually on the right hand side, that's 68 degrees. So where it says 20, that's 68 degrees. So right now we're around 66 or 62. Uh, so right down there, we're, 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 well, let's look over here. We're right at 62 to be exact. But anyway, this cold month of February, our second block, is going to be the coldest part. And then just in March, it just starts going up, and we'll talk about that. But that's why every day I give you the water temperature because that dictates what the fish are going to do. I want you to, again, to be, to be so aware of that. If you're a surf fisherman, if you're fishing out in the Gulf or, or freshwater fishing, it's all reflective. The freshwater is going to be a little bit warmer, of course, and, and the bay water is going to be a little bit warmer. But that's, that, what, that's what happens. And, that's for the Panama City Beach area right there. So uh, the big thing uh, is just understanding that, and and I watch it year after year. I watch it, and it, it's really good. I, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, once a month. I like to do like a little heritage story or some something of a history. I say once a month. I'd probably do it once every two or three months, but 
I always try to squeeze one in when I have time. So I want to, uh, this is just a story out of, out of my book. And I just, uh, there's so many little individuals. I say little, their story's not quite as big as the Davises, Anderson, because they didn't go generation after generation, but they still contributed a lot. So I want to look at this one right here real quick, because this guy was cool. Uh, Roy Martin, <laughs> he was a, a great story on him. Uh, he and his wife married, he, he was from Evansville, Indiana. And uh, he met his wife in a biology class. But anyway, they moved to Panama City in 1943. Hey, but he loved fishing. Now, I won't tell you how much he loved fishing. He was on the cover of an article on Life magazine. He was on a TV show, Today Show, with Dave Garraway. Uh, the Saturday Evening Post called, called him the world's greatest fisherman. So he actually got to fish with the, <laughs> Fidel Castro read about him and invited him to come fish with him. <laughs> so he went out on Castro's personal boat. And uh, Roy caught, he made a mistake, he caught the biggest uh, fish on the trip, and he actually got a plaque in 1960 from, from the government of Cuba. So what a, can you imagine uh, the story? But right here, that picture, he's out there, this is right where the, at Phillips Inlet, where the, where the condo is out there now, that would be sand dunes where the bull, bulldozed them down to build a condo. And he caught that cobia, and he was dragging up the hill there. And here's a picture of him here. He set all kind of records and did all kind of cool things. I'm, I'm gonna run, I want to really give him a, a, some credit on some of the things he did. He's very innovative. Uh, this is a 20 pound. He, he set a world record on that one. He was actually downtown here in Panama City. We had a Sears and Roebuck downtown. Ted Williams was a spokesman for, and Ted Williams came down and did a little clinic. But well, Roy Martin was invited and. Uh, and they got along great. Uh, Ted asked Roy a lot of questions. I, I got a lot of information. I'm, I'll finish up on this. There's more to talk about Roy Martin, but that's just part of our heritage here in the Florida Panhandle. And just some really uh, downright cool fishermen who just had a passion for it. And I'd like to recognize them and share that information with you. So I want to finish up on Roy later. I, don't, I didn't have time to get through it. Y'all do something good today for your fellow man, and let me know about it, okay? We'll share it. Have a great day, and God bless. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.